All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining the Ice Giant System seminar series. Uh, for those of you that are just joining us for the first time, this series uh, showcases recent developments in scientific topics covering aspects of ice giant systems, such as atmospheres, satellites, rings, magnetic fields, interior structures, um, any science related to the formation and evolution of the ice giants. Um, I'm going to go ahead and drop the link to the listserv into the chat. Um, and this link has uh, a spot where you can sign up for the listserv and also has information about upcoming and previous presentations uh, that you can take a look at. And we have YouTube videos linked to each of the previous presentations, including this one, uh, which will be uploaded at the presentation. Um, thank you to Ian Cohen, who has agreed to present this week. Um, I'm excited to uh, to hear what he has to say. Uh, Dr. Ian Cohen received his PhD in physics from the University of New Hampshire before joining the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab as a postdoctoral fellow, and then joined uh, as a senior professional staff. In the summer of 2023, he became the deputy chief scientist of APL's space exploration sector. He currently leads the energetic particle detector investigation aboard NASA's MMS mission and serves as the deputy project scientist for NASA's IMAP mission. His research interests focus on experimental space physics, specifically including magnetosphere, ionosphere coupling, energetic particle dynamics, and plasma and energetic particle instrumentation. And today he is here to present new insights on the Uranian magnetospheric coupling to the ionosphere, the moons, uh, and solar wind. And uh, take it away. Awesome. Thank you, Mallory, uh, for the introduction and for the invitation to present. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, excited to talk to you all about this topic that is near and dear to my heart. Um, looks like maybe at least one person's having audiovisual issues. Um, Hopefully everyone can see my slides in here. Um, I can hear you. Um, yep, I'm here. Got another stuff. thumbs up. I'd say <laughs> right. uh, keep going. Yeah, I'm gonna keep going. Hopefully Sarah can can uh, fix it on her end. So um, thanks to everyone for being here. Going to give a quick oversight, a little bit of an introduction to the magnetosphere because I know not everyone is necessarily a plasma physicist or, or a magnetospheric person. So I'm gonna give a little bit of a, what I hope will be a short primer on that uh, so we can all get up to speed. And then we're gonna look at a couple of new results that are coming out that kind of look at how the magnetospheric environment in which the Iranian system exists uh, affects not just the space plasma physics that's happening there, but also many of the things that you hold near and dear to your heart. So uh, the upper atmosphere, the moons, uh, as well as the, the impactor, the solar wind beyond the system. So we're going to get into that. And I'll uh, give a little bit of a disclaimer for anyone that uh, that saw Adam Master's presentation in this seminar series a few months ago. Um, you'll see some strong parallels to that presentation. Uh, tried really hard not to uh, reproduce what he showed, but a lot of, at the same time, you're going to see a similar kind of theme because we're, we're talking about the same topics. Okay, so this is what we're going to talk about today. Or, you know, it seems like a good way to structure a talk to talk about the past, the present, and the future. And so we're going to structure the talk in, in that sense. Okay, so what do we know about Uranus? Uh, <laughs> to, to lack, for lack of a better term, uh, the magnetosphere of Uranus is extremely topsy-turvy. It's uh, on the right here, you see a pretty simplified animation of what the system looks like. Remember, Uranus's orbit is uh, rotating on its side. We all know that. Uh, but in addition to that, it also has the largest dipole tilt of any planet in the solar system. So even though the planet is rotating like this, the magnetic field is actually 60 degrees or just close to 60 degrees offset from that. And so as the planet rotates around its rotational axis, what you're seeing here on the right is in the pink is how the magnetic field rotates in 17 hours as the planet rotates. And so this is a very simplified version of a, just what a dipole field would look like. Now, the field's actually much more complicated than that because we have stretching being driven by the magnetic field uh, or by the solar wind impinging from the sun side. You also have complex dynamics like reconnection, transport processes that are happening. And so this is the most simple 
uh, form that it could possibly be. And it's still something that much more complicated. Sorry, one second. Can you guys still hear me? I can hear you. Okay, perfect. Uh, uh, things popped up on the computer. I want to make sure I didn't lose my uh, my connection. Okay, so uh, even in the most simplified version of this, what you're seeing on the right, it's still a much, much more complex system than we have, say, Earth or either of the gas giants, where you have a relatively fixed rotational axis uh, that doesn't have a very large offset from the tilt. So for, for reference, Saturn has a, essentially a zero degree dipole tilt. Jupiter has 11 degrees, Earth has 23 degrees. You're looking at more than double that for Uranus. And so you get a very complicated time-dependent interaction of the configuration of the magnetic field relative to not only the impinging solar wind, which is in this image would be coming in from the left, uh, but you also get a very varied uh, interaction with the upper atmosphere because the planet is moving where those magnetic field lines map to the atmosphere changes as the planet rotates. Same thing with the moons where you can see their orbits uh, in the, the dark gray or, uh, lines there. What part of the magnetosphere they are interacting with at any given time will also change based on their orbital dynamics as well as the phase of the magnetic field. And so given this really complex system, there's a lot going on that we need to take into account when we're looking at the overall Uranian system and all the aspects that reside there in it. So uh, it's it's complex. It's also much bigger. It's about four times the size of Earth. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, it scales a four to one Earth radii per Uran uh, Uranus radii. Uh, so again, four or so times larger. Um, there's 27 moons in the system. The largest four, or sorry, the largest five being the classical satellites, Titania, Oberon, Embryo, Ariel, Miranda. You also have an extremely densely packed system of rings and small moons, including Puck uh, and Portia and the, the inner moons that are tucked in very close to the planet, probably right in the heart of the radiation belts. It's a fast spinner, like I said earlier, 17 hours. Um, and not only all, is all of this going on, but there's a lot of uh, interesting characteristics of the magnetic field and the, and the magnetosphere uh, that we'll talk about in a second that were, un, that were discovered by Voyager 2 and still are unexplained today. Oh, and the last thing too, uh, of course, because it is on the outer edges of the solar system, you have an 84-year orbital period to go around the sun, which leads to really, really intense seasonal variations between when one part of the, uh, the planet versus the other is, is, is exposed to the sunlight and therefore heated. It also gives you very different configurations of how this magnetic field interacts with the solar wind because as the planet's rotational axis changes relative to the sun, the direction at which you have the solar wind access into the planet changes very drastically on roughly 20-year timescales as the planet rotates around the sun. Okay, so, so again, looking back at Voyager era, uh, this is what we saw at the time of the Voyager 2 encounter. And right here, you can see again, a kind of more, a much <laughs> a static, uh, more simplified view of what we just showed in the animation, but basically the rotational axis at the time of the Voyager encounter was a solstice. Uh, so the, the spin axis was essentially straight on into the solar wind, but then you have this 60 degree offset of the magnetic field in the red here relative to that. Now, we knew prior to the Voyager era, era that uh, that Uranus rotated on its side because remote observations had shown that the that the um, moon plane was ortho roughly orthogonal to our the ecliptic, and so we we had a sense that that was uh, that that was the case. And what we actually thought with as we approach Uranus uh, in the ecliptic, uh, what we what we know to be the geographic polar region of the planet uh, that we would fly along the cusp. So we would actually, open, you know, this part of the, of the magnetosphere where the dipole field lines converge, this kind of throat area is known as the cusp region. We were expecting that cusp to be down here near the ecliptic. We thought we would fly essentially up the cusp as we approach the planet. But when we actually encountered the system in January 1986, we found out, uh, no, it's not that we have this extreme dipole tilt that we didn't, we were not aware of previously. That actually means that at least in the configuration that we flew, uh, encountered the system at near, um, near 19, in 1986, it was actually very similar to Earth, at least, you know, when you take a snapshot. Now, remember, this whole thing is rotating, but in this picture, 
this is actually not very different than Earth, right? The, the dipole off tilt at Earth is about 23 degrees. Uh, here, it's about 30, right, relative to the ecliptic. So it, it is an actually very Earth-like system in this snapshot. What you have to add into it is the fact that it's a much more dynamic system. And so the whole thing is changing on a roughly day scale, Earth day, uh, which is roughly comparable to, to a Uranian day. Uh, but we also know that there's this extended plasma sheet. This is the, the high density current region where, uh, where current stream to close kind of the global current system that we know also maps into the upper atmosphere. This is what the system looks like from uh, some of the early science papers where essentially we believe the plasma sheet uh, to be somewhat fixed. That's kind of this gray uh, shaded region. And then as you look at the flyby uh, trajectory of Voyager, in your in the the system that maps and moves with the rotation and the magnetic field of Uranus, you can actually see that we encountered the fl plasma sheet multiple times as we flew past the planet and down the tail. So uh, again, you know we have to think about multiple different coordinate systems because we have the fixed coordinate system for uh, for the planets, right? The the inertial coordinate system uh, as Voyager flies past the planet. But then we also have the coordinate system that moves with the magnetic field because all of this is so complex. And so when you move, look into that dynamic coordinate system, you can actually see how our trajectory interacts with this more stable plasma sheet structure in the system. So that's what we saw when we flew by Voyager, at least in a configuration standpoint. But what did we learn? So a couple of key things. So first, again, like I said, we found out about this tilted di magnetic di field dipole. We also found out that Uranus has one of the largest offsets in where the dipole magnetic field is. So in most planets like Earth um, and the rocky planets, the dipole is essentially centered at the, at the middle of the planet. Uh, but we found with uh, Uranus and also with Neptune that they're actually shifted slightly, which gives you some idea about what the internal composition might tell you, right? There might be some internal asymmetries in the planet that are causing that offset. But we were able to, to put together a what we call the offset tilted dipole approximation for the magnetic field of, of Uranus based on the Voyager flyby. We also found what was termed the a vacuum magnetosphere. So basically, as we flew through Uranian system, the Voyager 2 plasma measurements found that the densities of plasmas in the system are anomalously low. So much large, lower than we had expected, much lower than we're seeing at any other planet. So um, Ralph McNutt in his 1987-8 JGR paper termed this vacuum magnetosphere uh, term. Big question of why there is not an appreciable amount of plasma in the system. Uh, we'll, we're going to talk about that a little bit more, but one of the leading ideas now uh, is that basically the system is so chaotic and so time uh, variable that you just don't have long periods where the plasma can build up lower or you like you do at other planets. Uh, a similar result uh, that, or a, an analog result was that there were very intense radiation belts, especially in the electron population uh, than we had expected. Now, that actually, sort of contradicts the plasma issue because we we think the way that radiation belts work is you have a, a very low dense population of plasma processes take that low plasma reservoir and accelerate it up to higher energies that seed the radiation belts. But in this case, we have a really intense radiation belt with no clear plasma reservoir. So it's one of the big mysteries of the energetic particle environment at Uranus is how do you get that intense radiation population with a relatively un, uh, un obvi non-obvious plasma source to draw on? Another interesting piece that came out is that uh, unlike uh, all the other giant systems, we only found protons and molecular hydrogen ions. There were no evidence of heavy ions that you'd expect from the solar wind or from other sources, be those moons or uh, or the upper atmosphere. And then last but not least, a very interesting result uh, was that we saw the, the strongest Whistler mode waves of any planet uh, that Voyager saw at any planet were found in the radiation belt environment of, of Uranus between the orbits of Miranda and Ariel. And so these waves are one of the primary plasma waves that can draw can drive acceleration. They can also drive particle losses. Uh, so these are waves that are 
plasma waves that are very important for the, the plasma and particle dynamics that are occurring in the magnetosphere. And so we're going to reference these again in a bit, but this is a really important point. Again, kind of in this inner magnetospheric region where the radiation belts are, uh, were a lot of curious findings from Voyager that are still unanswered today because we haven't yet been back with an orbiter mission to investigate that. And I'll also underscore that one of the big issues with a flyby is that, especially on magnetospheric plasma physics timescales, a flyby is such a short encounter uh, relative to the, right, the, the time scale of a few days or a few hours in each of these regions as the, as the spacecraft flies through is roughly comparable or faster than the time, or sorry, slower than the time scales of the processes that we're looking at. And so one of the biggest questions about Uranus is how much of what Voyager 2 saw is characteristic of the quasi steady state of the planet and how much of it is a transient that we may or may not have caught, right? Is Are these wave populations, for example, normal, or is it a transient event that we can't compare to a baseline because we only have the one observation? Same thing goes with the vacuum magnetosphere. Same thing goes with the intense radiation belts. Are these the typical state of the, of the system, or are these because of some random event that might have happened and Voyager happened to catch? We really don't know because we haven't established that baseline of what the system is uh, in different, in any season, let alone across different seasons. Okay. So uh, we talked a little bit about the past. Now we're going to talk about what we're what we know today and what we're working to try to figure out uh, with new research. So one of the things that we didn't necessarily know at the time of Voyager, uh, remember, let's take us back to 1986. Uh, we had not yet uh, encountered all of the planets in the solar system, right? We had not yet been to, to Neptune. Uh, we had not orbited any of the planets other than Earth at this point at this period, um, and um, uh, Mars and Venus, uh, but the, the outer solar system was a major unknown, right? And so we did not necessarily have the going on 35 years of additional knowledge that we have now to be able to an, analyze and assess what we were seeing at Uranus. And so in the ensuing 30 years, we now know that all strongly magnetized planets have radiation belts, right? So Earth, uh, at the very dawn of the space age, we found this out. And since then, we now know that Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune all have radiation belts. We've also had, uh, we've also found evidence that this might be a universal process, right? Radiation belts might be something that even uh, astrophysical processes like uh, the Crab Nebula might have, right? And so one of the big questions is, how do you take our understanding at Earth, which is very well characterized now, uh, and Jupiter, which is much better characterized than, than any other planet other than Earth, and scale that to these worlds that we don't know quite as much about, Uranus and Neptune, as well as universal processes beyond like astrophysical systems like supernova remnants. And one of the big things that we want to try to do is be able to, to constrain our understanding of magnetospheric processes and radiation belt processes so that we can co confine and bound our ability to extrapolate to systems beyond those that we've investigated. And Uranus and Neptune in particular really do provide very crucial missing data points between the extremes of Earth and Jupiter, and then hopefully those beyond. So we're, we're trying to collect as much information about magnetospheric systems as possible so that we can bound our understanding and allows us to extrapolate and interpolate, right, to all those exoplanet systems that might live somewhere in between. So another thing that we've learned uh, much more over the last 30 years is, again, comparing these outer planetary systems to Earth. Uh, we've had lots of missions looking at the magnetosphere and the, in particular the radiation belts of Earth uh, over the last 30 years. In most particular, uh, it was the Van Allen probes mission that went to Earth and really looked at the radiation belt environment. And so now, building on 30 years of information, we know that the radiation belts are essentially a result in the balance of different processes, right? You have sourcing and acceleration of the particles that get you up to very high energies. And then there are also loss processes that can take particles out of the system. And so having a robust part radiation belt environment is a balance of the acceleration and the source processes that create and the loss processes that, that reduce the intensities. And so you must think that to sustain a robust radiation belt, you have to have an acceleration and a source process that 
outperforms your loss process. Otherwise, you would lose particles much faster and you wouldn't be able to sustain the radiation belts. But like I referenced earlier, the Uranus is sort of an outlier. So what you see on the left here are the most intense radiation, uh, electron radiation uh, spectra, right? So intensity on the y-axis, energy on the right axis. These were the most intense spectra of electrons observed at each of the uh, outer planets, as well as Earth. And what you can see almost immediately is that Jupiter is the outlier, right? It has these very harsh radiation environment that we know Jupiter for, right? It's extremely intense beyond 1 MeV. But what you also notice is that both Earth and Uranus essentially hang with the Jovian radiation environment up until about 1 MeV, and then they both fall, start to fall off. But if you trace uh, a line, and this is you know, relatively rough because we don't have a lot of bounding uh, data, especially at the ice giants, but if you roughly trace the amount of density, plasma density at lower energies that exists in the system and how much uh, energy or the intensity that you can expect at one MeV, which is kind of representative of the upper edge of the radiation or the upper uh, population of the radiation belt, they essentially track linearly, right? The more plasma you have to draw on, the higher intensity you can expect to see at the higher energies, except for Uranus, which, as I said earlier, is high off the scale. We have a really high intensity electron radiation belt, but no clear plasma source to pull on. And we don't understand why this is the case. But like I said, we've gotten a lot of insights into radiation belts over the last 30 years. We have Van Allen probes at Earth that I referenced earlier. We also have the Cassini mission that orbited Saturn and was able to probe the Saturnian radiation belts. And then, of course, we have Juno, which is currently orbiting Jupiter and has also been able to probe the radiation belts of Jupiter to uh, with a new uh, level of fidelity. And so what can we do with these this new information from orbiting missions over the last 30 years at these systems to inform what we think might be happening at, at Uranus? So one of the things that we know is that, or, and especially from the Van Allen probes, is that Whistler mode waves uh, are one of the things that can cause wave-induced losses or acceleration. And like I said earlier, we saw some of the most intense Whistler mode waves in the Voyager era at Uranus. And so these waves could either drive losses, which would reduce the intensity of the radiation belts, or they can cause acceleration that might drive the growth of the radiation belts. But the problem is, like I said earlier, with the flyby information from Voyager, we can't distinguish those two, right? The movie here on the bottom right shows uh, a year, few years worth of data from Van Allen probes, and you can see the variability in the system, right? So this is built up from multiple orbits every day over several years, and you can see how variable the radiation environment is. Now imagine that you only had one of those orbits. Would you be able to tell you anything about the variability of the system? No. And that's where we are with Voyager in, in Uranus. And so going back and getting repeated orbits to be able to build up the baseline and understand the variability of the system to driving from the solar wind and, and the internal system is really important to be able to answer this question. But uh, there was also an, an idea of how do you source these particles? There was an idea early on in the Voyager era that there was this really intense uh, population of energetic particles. So if you look between, this is looking at the intensity of the, of the proton channels from the LACP instrument. Uh, if you look at the, the flyby, this is the inbound part of the orbit. This is closest approach. This is the outbound part of the orbit. If you look in the same region between Ariel and Miranda, so Ariel, Miranda, Miranda, Ariel, uh, between the inbound orbit and the outbound orbit, there's about a three orders of magnitude difference between the, the particle population. Originally, this was thought to be an energetic particle injection. So this is a really dynamic, tail dynamic induced injection of particles from the tail side towards the planet. We know that this happens at Earth. We've seen them happen at Mercury, uh, Jupiter, Saturn as well. So this was the original explanation for this. And this would be something that is a very uh, universal process, we think, in planetary magnetospheres and might explain why how we get particles into the inner magnetosphere to source the radiation belts. Now, we're going to come back to this in a little bit with some of the new research that we have, but this was an original idea for how you might source that energetic particle population in the inner magnetosphere. There's also the loss aspect. Uh, one of the big things that we're looking at, especially with Earth uh, and, the, and the Jovian system, is 
how do particles as they come from the tail side of the magnetosphere drift around the planet and interact with the day side to be lost from the system? What is the loss process for energetic particles and plasma? We think that that's a major source of loss at Earth, but that could be even more important at Uranus and Neptune because the complexity of the magnetic topology is so drastic that you might constantly be losing particles to the day side and to the flanks um, at, a, at a rate much higher than at Earth. And so that, you know, are, are fairly, um, I would say, juvenile, right, uh, uh, modeling expertise uh, in the ice giant magnetospheres and the limited observational data that we have makes it really hard to constrain that. But we have a feeling that, and you're going to see a little bit of this in the new results in a minute, uh, we think that this might be in a really important player in why there's such a weak plasma population in the system. Okay, so given that there's all those unknowns and information that we have from other uh, analogous systems that we've learned, uh, what can we do specifically at Uranus to get more information? So I'm going to bring us back to that uh, weird asymmetry between the inbound and outbound orbits in the regions between Ariel and Miranda. So again, on the right, uh, this is the two regions that we're looking at between the inbound orbit and the outbound orbit. Like I said earlier, originally in the Voyager era, this was assumed to be a transient magnetospheric process called an energetic particle injection. Basically, the reason they thought that that was the case was because they couldn't uh, come up with a more... Uh, dynamic process that would cause that. And originally they thought that this was actually more extreme or, or appeared to be more extreme than it really was because it was an artifact of the trajectory. Basically the idea being that during the inbound orbit, you were at higher magnetic latitudes, which means you would not be able to see as many particles. And so this was not actually a real, uh, it, the three orders of magnitude difference wasn't as real as uh it was observed to be, they thought it was basically exacerbated by the fact that the orbit was, was as it was. But if you look back at the actual orbit, this is the inbound trajectory. This is all plotted in uh, magnetic latitude. So you can see it is true that we were at higher magnetic latitude during the inbound orbit than the outbound orbit. But this about 15 degrees, 20 degrees is not large enough to account for this sort of three orders of magnitude uh, discrepancy. And so this really caught our interest and was something that we wanted to look at uh, more closely. The other interesting thing is that if you look at the characteristics of the particles in this region in particular, they're not only intense, they're also very uh, trapped in what we call pitch angle space. So pitch angle space is the uh, velocity of the particle as it gyrates around the field line relative to the direction of the field line. So if you have a what we call a trapped distribution, your particles are orbiting essentially perpendicular to the magnetic field line. If you have a, an isotropic distribution, you'll get something that's much more distributed in all pitch angle. And what you can see here at the bottom, the 90 degree pitch angles where your orthogonal are in the middle, and you see these very peaked distributions. And that's going to be important in just a second. So one of the interesting things is to have something that's very peaked in pitch angle space, right? A very trapped distribution. Normally, when you have something like that, any steep gradient in pitch angle space will drive waves. And those waves will try to isotropize the, uh, the, the distribution, right? Nature abhors gradients. It doesn't like them. It will try to, um, to counteract them. But what we saw is that if we look at the ion observations from LECP, uh, from about a few hundred keV all the way up to over one MeV, they are extremely, extremely peaked in pitch angle space. You have these very strong pitch angle gradients. And the question is, how can you possibly maintain that? Because the wave generation should get rid of it. And so the only thing that we could think of was that you must have a source of particles that's creating them at 90 degrees, that's overcoming any loss process that would isotropize the distribution. And so this really got us interested here. How do you maintain this distribution? And we did some really simple modeling to show that if you start with this peak to distribution and you don't do anything, it will isotropize, right? So you go from the blue over time, over about six hours to this uh, pink distribution, which is much more isotropic and pitch angle. Now, if you start losing particles because they start interacting with the moon, say, you'll have the same thing happen, right? You isotropize, but you also reduce the overall intensity, right? So again, you go from the blue to pink, the only way that you can keep a distribution similar to what Voyager observed 
is if you add a source of near 90 degree particles, that's what keeps it to have this shape without it isotropizing. So that tells you that we think at least uh, theoretically, there should be a source of particles. So now we wanted to see if there was any evidence that there was one. So we went back to the Voyager LECP observations and looked at what we call the phase space density. So this is a characteristic of the particles that basically it makes it really easy for you to find sources of particles and losses of particles. Sources are represented as global peaks or, or peaks and losses are, are identified as troughs. And so what you see here is the phase space density profile. You see these two immediate troughs right here. These are actually caused by the moons, Miranda and Ariel. The moons are basically coming through and sweeping particles out. They're interacting with the surface of the moons. And so they're, they're a loss mechanism, right? They're taking particles out of the system. But what you notice is that there's a global peak, a global maximum between those two moons. That is evidence of a source of energetic particles. So there is in fact a source that's causing energetic particles in the region between Uranus and, uh, sorry, uh, Ariel and Miranda. And now you'll remember that's the exact same region where we talked about that three orders of magnitude difference between the inbound and outbound orbits, right? So there is something introducing energetic particles into the system. So now the question is, what is the potential source? And so we went through a little bit of a thought experiment to try to explore what we think could be some of the most poten uh, most plausible potential reasons. The first was particle injections. This was the original idea that was put forth in the Voyager era. The second is CRAND, uh, which is, we know is an important process for sourcing radiation belts at Earth and Saturn. And then last but not least, the idea that maybe these particles are coming from one or more of the moons. Okay, <clears throat> so the particle injection idea, uh, like I said, it, particle injections are a dynamic process that we know happens in magnetospheres at Earth, Jupiter, and Saturn. Uh, but the evidence doesn't really hold up that these would be injections at Uranus because uh, the, the pitch angles uh, distributions for electrons don't show anything similar. There's no drift signatures, which is a, a characteristic that you tend to see with injections. There's also no clear reason why you would get that steep pitch angle gradient in, a, in an injection. That's not what we typically see. And so, yes, it would explain the energies, the intensities, but it doesn't really explain the pitch angle distribution that we saw. And so we think that this is not a reasonable uh, potential source for this, for this inject, for these particles. The second thing is what we, it's called CRAN. So this is cosmic ray albedo neutron decay. So the, I, the way that this works is a, a very, very high energy, few GeV cosmic ray from somewhere in space comes into the system and hits a material. That could be the rings, it could be the upper atmosphere, it could be the surface of a, of a moon, but basically what happens is the cosmic ray hits a material and causes a neutron to come off. That neutron exists for a very short period of time before it decays into a proton. And so basically what happens is you have a cosmic ray from somewhere in the system creating a population of protons in the system. And like I said, we know that this is an important process at Earth uh, and Saturn and may play an important role at Jupiter too. And if anybody has really important uh, detailed questions about CRAN, uh, John Cooper, who I know is on the call, is an expert, and I will direct all of your questions to him. Uh, but basically what we looked at was if you were to look at the phase space density and we tried to model the phase space density in the system, uh, normally you would get something like this, where Uranus is on the left and you would have the phase space density increase as you get further and further away from the planet. If you have a <clears throat> crammed source where you think Uranus is the most significant source, the upper atmosphere is the most significant source of crammed, then that CRAN source would fall off as you get further away from the, from the planet. And so the overall system phase space density would look something like this, where you do have a maximum, a, a local maximum between the two moons, but that's largely just because you have the fact that the moons are causing losses on each side. You don't get that global maximum like we saw in the Voyager data. The only way that you really get a global maximum is with a CRAN-like source where you may be getting some contribution from the planet, but you have a local source of particles in that region. And then you can get this global maximum that we see here in the green. So CRAN might be contributing to what we're seeing, but it's not, it doesn't give us the radial profile that we would expect and a source right between Miranda and Ariel. So we don't think CRAN uh, is, is a credible, at least driver of this source of energetic particles. Last but not least, we know about moons, right? Now, since the Voyager era, we've realized that there are 
active cryovolcanic ocean worlds throughout the solar system. In fact, we think every other giant system except for Uranus has an ocean world somewhere in it. Now, the idea of moon, the moon sourcing the particles is actually consistent with some other observations from Voyager, both in the LECP as well as the uh, plasma sensor. Uh, one of the important things to remember is that Voyager LECP could not measure ion composition. So there is, uh, we talked early on that they only observe protons and molecular hydrogen, but to get to the energy regime where you could look at composition with LECP, you needed to be up over. 2 MeV. And so my personal uh, hypothesis is that the solar wind high energy, uh, high mass species and anything that might be coming from moons or anything like that in the system is not a high enough energy for LECP to have gotten the, uh, the composition measurements. And so there's, there's an entire range of composition measurements from a few KeV up to a few hundred KeV that we just could not prove uh, probe with Voyager. It's a, it's a major gap in our ability to make the measurement. But if the moons were sourcing those particles, how would that work? So in theory, this is what we think happens at other planets, is the moon introduces cold neutral material, right? That material is not ionized. It's neutral. It comes off. We think at Io and Europa and possibly Enceladus, it creates a torus, uh, maybe even Triton. We know that that occurs. If that neutral material exists in the magnetosphere, it will be ionized by the plasma, right? There's charge exchange between the plasma and the neutrals that can ionize that plasma. Now, when you have very cold plasma, uh, that is, it can generate, especially if it's anisotropic, right? If there's any sort of anisotropies, it will generate what we call electromagnetic ion cyclotron waves. We know that this occurs at Earth and affects electrons. We posit that the same thing can happen for ions and that those emic waves will generate nine, near 90 degree pitch angles, right? So it will preferentially create this steep pitch angle gradient uh, that we observe with LACP. And if the process happens faster than the losses from the waves, you will always have a source of near 90 degree particles that can sustain that steep gradient. And so... This is the only of these three that we could come up with that actually checks all the boxes. Now, important caveat, we cannot say whether or not the moon source is because the moon is active, right? There's a geyser or something like that that might be actively sourcing into the system or whether or not it's just sputtering from the surface, right? Energetic particles could be knocking off uh, water or other salt ices uh, from the surface and causing a torus like that. We cannot, we don't have the observations to be able to differentiate bet between those two ideas, but we do think uh, that we have evidence that it is in fact the moon that's causing this, this source of particles. Now, the other important thing to note is that we couldn't actually look at whether or not those type of waves exist with Voyager because the, the frequency regime where those ion modes exist was not covered by Voyager. So the, the waves that we talked about earlier uh, that Voyager did see were electron mode waves. The frequency regime that, that covers the ion waves that would do the same thing was actually in between uh, what the, the spacecraft magnetometers could do. And so two very important observations for us if we go back to be able to close this, this knowledge gap is super thermal, so few tens of keV to few hundreds of keV ion composition, and getting a more complete uh, plasma wave frequency coverage so that we can look at those ion mode waves. Okay, uh, so that, that was one topic. We're gonna shift gears a little bit into something that's uh, that new work that is going on right now. Uh, and to do that, we're gonna talk very quickly about what uh, a process that's important in magnetospheric uh, physics called magnetic reconnection. So uh, very simplistically, if you have uh, anti-aligned magnetic fields. So if you look here on the right, you've got the, or sorry, on the left, you've got orange field lines that are pointing down, blue field lines that are pointing up. These are opposite to each other. Uh, if that happens, uh, the magnetic field will try to essentially shortcut. And this process where the field lines connect and reconfigure is known as magnetic reconnection. Uh, so what'll basically happen is reconnection occurs at this, what we call the X line here. <clears throat> and then the field reconfigures like this. And as these field lines relax, uh, this is a major process that accelerates particles. And we know that because we have uh, a new mission at Earth called MMS, which is specifically looking at the detailed physics of this interaction. We know that magnetic reconnection plays a very important role 
in the magnetospheric dynamics at Earth. It's actually one of the driving processes that allows uh, energy and momentum from the solar wind to enter the Earth magnetosphere. And then uh, the, the, the global convection and transport is all driven by reconnection. We, it's unclear how major of a role that that plays at even uh, Jupiter, let alone Uranus and Neptune. But uh, we did look at what we think reconnection might look like at Uranus. And so what you're seeing here on the right is essentially a plot of the angle between the solar wind as it propagates out at about 20 RU, or, sorry, uh, or, uh, AU, and, uh, and the magnetic field of Uranus. So what you're seeing in the middle, that rotating is the same thing that we showed at the very beginning, that rotating dipolar field at Uranus. And now what we're looking at is the Uranian system from the vantage point of the sun, essentially. And we're looking at how the angles between the Uranian magnetic field and the solar wind vary as the planet rotates. And what you're seeing here is the yellow regions are the regions where that angle is the most extreme. And that's where we think reconnection might occur. And so what you're seeing here is the, the pink uh, that's kind of dancing through are the regions where we think reconnection can occur. And the takeaway here is that even through a in a kind of a random seasonal configuration, as Uranus rotates, reconnection can essentially occur everywhere along the, the day side magnetosphere. So what you're seeing here is that that pink is kind of moving all over the place as the planet rotates, because the conditions that we think need to occur for reconnection are essentially ubiquitous. And we have other simulations here that you're, uh, you're not necessarily going to show right now, but the takeaway is that it doesn't matter what season it is, it doesn't matter what part of the rotation of the planet it is, there are always favorable conditions for reconnection at Uranus. Uh, this is just, again, something similar to, to a different configuration, but we think that there are, are actually uh, conditions and seasons like this one here on the left, where you get something very Earth-like, where you get reconnection across a large swath of the day side. Uh, you can see it here kind of in a three, in an isogrid uh, projection where you can see the, the magnetosphere in curved uh, form in all three dimensions. And you can see this extended region where reconnection can occur. That is very, very similar to what we call the Dungy cycle here at Earth, where we know reconnection drives the input of energy momentum from the solar wind into the system. And so these new results that were that are um, being led by Drew Turner here at APL shows that Uranus might be very Earth-like in how it interacts with the solar wind. Uh, this, is a, this is a different configuration that happens during a different season where instead of that very elongated reconnection uh, uh, space, you get very localized reconnection in very small uh, parts of the magnetosphere. And again, as Uranus rotates, if we were to show all of the movies, you see how dynamic this all is, as opposed to Earth, where it tends to be much more stable relative to the solar wind. Again, this is showing just the, the kind of uh, variation that you get in the system between seasons and rotations. This configuration looks very Earth-like, where you have one side uh, essentially compressed and driven by the solar wind, the other side elongated in the tail. But then you have other seasons where the whole thing is flipped on its side, and this is not Earth-like or like any other planet in the solar system where you have uh, essentially uh, this kind of north-south driving as opposed to sunward, anti-sunward. Again, uh, you know, there, there are kind of in-between seasons where you get, instead of just one hemisphere occurring with reconnection, you can actually get it on both, but again, very different than an extended X line like we see at Earth. What's really interesting that Drew did was he actually uh, not only wanted to look at how, what the coupling to the solar wind might look like, but what did the coupling to the atmosphere look like? We know that when, at Earth at least, when reconnection occurs on the day side, those field lines map into the ionosphere, the upper atmosphere of Earth, and it can be associated with auroral features. You get losses uh, from, the, from, the, um, from the system into the upper atmosphere. And what Drew was able to do was essentially take these regions where you see uh, reconnection on the day side, the pink in all of these different configurations, and map those to what you might expect the auroral emissions to look like in the upper atmosphere. That's what you see on the blue uh, spheres. And these are generally consistent with Hubble observations of what the aurora looks like uh, from the studies like those led by Laurent Lamy uh, with, uh, with the Hubble time. And so what we think might be happening is that the reconnection of the day side might cause and explain why we see the very spot-like aurora at Uranus that has been observed with Hubble. 
The other thing that's really important here is the upper atmosphere of Uranus is hotter than we would expect. And we posit that it might be energetic particle precipitation from reconnection as well as the convection. So when reconnection happens, the, the field lines from the day side move tailward because the solar wind is dragging them. Those field lines are also tied into the upper atmosphere. So the, those field lines and the plasma are moving through the upper atmosphere and interacting with the neutral plasma that's in the upper atmosphere. That's called joule heating. We know it's an important process here at Earth, but it actually might be an even more important process that's heating the upper atmosphere at Uranus than it is at Earth. And so that's something that we don't think has really been uh, explored yet that well um, by the upper atmospheric community, especially because we it seems like um, the, the magnetospheres and upper atmospheres community uh, need to talk a little bit more. And, that, and to be clear, this is something that still uh, we know happens at Earth, but is actually uh, poorly quantified. Uh, even uh, even at our own planet. So might be something for uh, folks on this call who are upper atmosphere experts. Uh, we would love to talk to you to see about this, how this might be inter uh, affecting the upper atmosphere of Uranus. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, wrap up here, but basically uh, there's a lot going on in magnetosphere, ionosphere, atmosphere, and moons coupling. The magnetosphere hits on all of these different aspects of the system. We think that uh, there is a source of energetic particles between Ariel and Miranda. We know that the coupling to the solar wind might be more, much more complex than it is here at Earth. That might have very significant in, uh, implications for the upper atmosphere as well. And so I'm going to uh, cut very quickly to the future. What's next? We know UOP is the highest priority flagship uh, for the next decade. And uh, we're going to look at a lot of different aspects of what uh, the system entails, including uh, the connections to heliophysics, so the solar wind. Uh, but most importantly, for me at least, uh, there are many science questions looking at the magnetosphere. So what dynamo processes drive the magnetic field? And then how do those plasma sources and dynamics of the magnetosphere interact with the solar wind, the atmosphere, and the satellites? And I would posit that the, the magnetospheric environment extends just beyond this, uh, this pink box here. There are a lot of ties to the general magnetospheric environment to all of the science questions on this uh, page. So I'll leave it there. Uh, I know that was a lot, especially for the uh, non-initiated magnetospheric folks in the audience, but uh, thanks for bearing with me. Thank you, Ian. Um, go ahead and put your claps uh, your clap emojis there or thanks in the chat. Um, this was really interesting and covered uh, a whole lot of information about uh, what we know about the Uranus system and, and what we want to know. Um, so if you have a question, feel free to type it in the chat and I'll read it aloud um, or raise your hand. Um, I see we already have some questions. Uh, I'll give it to John Cooper, go ahead. Yes, hi, 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 and great talk. Thank you. Um, so, why do you think we didn't see heavy ions in the magnetosphere with Voyager? I mean, we only saw protons and a bit of H two plus or something. I think. Uh, so, if this, if there is a an inner source from the moons, why didn't we see heavier ions, or did we? Sorry, muted. Uh, yeah, great question, John. So if you look at Ralph McNutt's early papers from the PLS observation, so, so PLS was a Faraday cup. Um, for, for those of you that aren't familiar with that sort of observation, it doesn't make a direct measurement of the composition. It basically gets a, a current distribution, and then you, you fit distributions of different populations being uh, different uh, energy distributions as well as composition to basically figure out what you're seeing. If you look at the observations from PLS in the region that we were highlighting here, there is actually a sea of what could be heavy ions there, but they were uh, at the time of the Voyager analysis assumed to be very hot proton distributions. So there is some evidence that there might be heavy ions there in the PLS observations. They just didn't use that in the fit because they didn't think that that was um, a probable uh, result. For LACP, I personally think that you just don't build up the helium or any of the heavy ions to high enough energy. So for LACP, you had to get above 2 MeV to be able to get the helium composition. And I think that there's a lot of superthermal 
tens, hundreds of KEV populations that just don't get to that high enough energy to be able to be resolved by LACP. Okay, well, they were hiding. That's <laughs> yeah. possible. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. All right, D. Santos Costa, go ahead. Yeah, Nicole Andre from uh, IRAP to France. Uh, very nice talk. Thank you very much. I had two questions. In fact, the first one is how far were we with Voyager 2 from uh, Ariel and Miranda in radial distance and possibly longitude or whatever can be used to, to quantify that? And the second, you mentioned again the PLS signatures. Can you comment or maybe show it uh, a bit more? Thank sure. Uh, so first question, off the top of my head, I don't know the flyby distances from Ariel and Miranda, but we cross their orbital, right? So that, that's one of the nice things about looking at plasma populations, energetic particles in particular, is they can persist in the regions of the magnetosphere long beyond uh, and much further away from where the actual moons are themselves. And so we're kind of remote sensing the moons, if you will, or, or their environments, but even without getting close to them. So um, I don't think that the close flybys were, you know, within a few particle gyro radii uh, to be able to directly sense if there were, say, a distributed cloud or anything like that. Um, I'd have to get back with you on the exact numbers. But as far as the uh, the observations from PLS, give me one second. Let me find the uh, Ralph's paper, and I can show you exactly what I'm talking about with that um, distribution of not protons. Um, I've got it right here. Um, so just to show you all what I'm looking at. So this is uh, Ralph McNutt's LEP, uh, PLS observation uh, GR, uh, JGR paper from the special issue in 1987. And if you scroll down through this paper, not there. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Nope, sorry, was that one? So for instance, if you look at this distribution right here, I'm trying to get it to a place where everyone can see, uh, but in, so I'll, I'll show you two to kind of um, juxtapose. So in this distribution, you have a very clear uh, proton distribution here, right? And not very much else going on. Uh, and again, these are essentially energy per charge versus intensity or current. And so if you get, you would fit this to a distribution, things that are lower in energy per charge would essentially be um, protons, uh, things that are out here might be hotter distributions or heavier mass. If you look at this distribution in particular, which actually occurs in the same region where we see the source of particles, you get a lot more of a sea of things out here. And they assumed that this was a hotter distribution of protons and did not consider that it could be cold, heavy ion species, as we might suggest it might be. Um, but you see there's a lot more going on out here in this environment or in this um, region than over here. And, uh, you know, Daniel, if you want to talk specifically about where these distributions are taken, we can we can talk offline. But um, but this is kind of what we're what we're keying in on. And we did talk to Ralph McNutt with this, and he uh, admitted that that might be a plausible observation uh, explanation that there are other heavy ion species that they just hadn't considered. All right, uh, I'm going to post some community news in the chat, uh, but let's keep going with questions. We have about four minutes left. Uh, Cesar Grava, go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, hi, uh, this is Cesar Grava from Southwest Research Institute in San Antonio, Texas. Very nice talk. Uh, I learned a lot, uh, even from non magnetic experts like myself. I have a question uh, uh, about that um, increase, the difference in free orders of magnitude between uh, Milan and Ariel. Uh, you mentioned reconnection, and um, uh, from your presentation uh, and other papers like uh, Fink Kawa and Pati, uh, 2017. So you said the reconnection happens uh, uh, very frequently. Mm -hmm. um, so is it possible that um, this reconnection might have uh, injected the fresh plasma from the solar wind, and that's what you see from between Milan and Ariel? Uh, it's unlikely that. So if if reconnection did inject plasma into the upper atmosphere, which again, we know happens, uh, the magnetic configuration wouldn't allow it, or you, you wouldn't expect it to be in that region, right? So if this is the planet, the, the, the very closed field lines in the inner magnetosphere where you get trout populations and where we were looking is not where that plasma from reconnection would, would, would map to, right? It would map to the cusp regions 
and the magnetic cup regions and the upper plant and the upper atmosphere of the planet, it wouldn't make its way into the uh, trapped region in the intermagnetosphere. Now, you could say that reconnection at Earth would cause reconnection in the tail, and that might shoot plasma back into the intermagnetosphere. But that's not the signatures that we saw in that region are not characteristic of what we would expect to see with injections, especially that steep gradient and pitch angles. Um, so that's that's why we thought we could rule that out. I see. You. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, Sushan, go ahead. Um, hi. So uh, you said that uh, the temperature in the upper atmosphere of Uranus is higher, and it has to do uh, like uh, with the magnetic activity. But if you see, like since 1998 until now, the temperature is actually dropping. Like that's from the observation of H3 plus ions. Mm -hmm. So, do you have any comment on that? Like, uh... so, uh, so I'll I'll uh, caveat that I, you know it's a hypothesis that the magnetospheric uh, interaction might be contributing to the fact that it's that it's hotter than we had thought. Uh, I know that the atmosphere is cooling, and we've been looking at that since the equinox, but that remember the the nature of the interaction with the magnetosphere and the solar wind is also changing seasonally and we haven't gone through the entire you know one to one correlation of how that changes yet um it's something that we're thinking about and one of the reasons why we'd like to think talk more with the upper atmospheric folks about this but um it's possible that the nature of the magnetosphere solar wind interaction is also changing at the same time that the upper atmosphere is cooling that that might be part of it. Um, but I, I de definitely want to couch it that this is a hypothesis. Uh, we're not claiming that that's the case. All right. We're at the top of the hour. I see, John, you have another question. Um, I'd ask that you ask Ian offline uh, real quick. I just wanted to show uh, uh, this slide here to save the date for the next Uranus flagship workshop. It's going to be really exciting. Um, in May uh, of next year, 2024, and it's gonna be hosted at Goddard. Um, so put it on your calendars and there will be an indication of interest that will come up soon. Um, thank you, Ian, so much for giving this presentation and agreeing to talk here. Um, it was a really informative talk uh, and take care everyone. Have a good rest of your week. Thanks everybody.